What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the best podcast on planet Earth. This is the Anything Better podcast with Paul Bersey, Bill Burr, Greek freak Andrew Themlis producing out there in Beverly Hills, and you guys are listening to episode number Quattro Uno. Is that right? No. I don't know how to say 41. In the, I can say it in French, I think. You guys are listening to episode number 41. And um, I, I don't know who is 41 in sports. Uh, well, you're going to be surprised. All right. Dirk Nowitzki. Should have known that one. Tom Seaver. Wes Unseld. Jerry Royce from the Dodgers. Glenn Rice. Eddie Matthews. Glenn Rice. Cal Hubbard. I don't know him. And then we got a hockey player here, uh, Yaroslav Halak. Sounds like a goaltender to me. I feel like the next four numbers are just going to be weird. I think Dude, it's number a- 42 is Ronnie Lott. What are you talking about? Oh, wait a minute. Mariano Rivera and Jackie Robinson. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the next number is going to, next few numbers are going to be like two of the most iconic. Yeah, one that's retired in all of baseball. Well, Bill, we were talking about something earlier. I want to jump into this, okay, in this episode. Why? Because I, t- I touched on it. I wanted to do a joke on it. I don't know how. Why do Americans, I don't know if it's Americans, why do people hate billionaires? Is it because, okay, is it because... They just, I guess this is what I'm thinking is since people are stupid, they're just seeing the billionaire as a billionaire. They're just seeing Jeff Bezos as the guy who's got a fucking trillion dollars and does Amazon. They're not seeing that that guy started, dropped out of school, like worked for McDonald's and then started Amazon out of his garage. They're not seeing that. Now they're hating him about jumping in his rocket, going into space, hanging out. Well, they're also kind of hating him because he makes his truck drivers drive like 20 hours a fucking night, doesn't he? I mean, that Walmart. I'm sure. Yeah. No, they said he treats his like workers like shit, but then it's like, you know, you can't do that though, Paul. You can't do no. that. You're already, you're already gonna get shit. Dude, look at I look know. at what's this face. Look at Dave Portnoy. Yeah. From Barstool. They're always like coming at this guy. Yeah. And, and like, I don't know, watching that whole story, right? Like, look, obviously, I don't know what happened, but like I know that news doesn't care. All they care about is sensationalism and eyeballs and banner ads. And what was claimed against him was going to get him a bunch of eyeballs. But what he said back, mm-hmm. that he was getting warned by all his ex-girlfriends and all that, I mean, that's like a blockbuster thing. Like That's crazy. Like, wow. That's, First of all, that's if your crazy. ex-girlfriends are warning you, that's that his, his side of the story is showing that he's a good guy. Why doesn't that get the same amount of coverage? Why do they just say, oh, he just denied it? Because they don't want to get in trouble because that's the wrong side of the narrative of those stories. And like, I don't know, just watching like this whole thing where it's like he should have the right to defend himself as as much as the people should have the right to accuse him of something. And I'm just not seeing a balance in that story. And considering they've already tried to take this guy out so many friggin' do you see the time when they try to make it seem like he was a bad boss and that is uh Dude, it was classic, classic like bias in the media where it was like they said he only had he had one woman CEO and she was a CEO in name only. And then she came back at that liberal guy going in name only. I built this company by 65 percent and went off on the guy. So the other guy was actually being like sexist. So why didn't the spotlight go on him and the irony, the Shakespearean flip there? Of wait, you're saying this guy's sexist. Turns out you're sexist. He just slithered back into the grass and nothing fucking happened. I'm telling yeah. you, dude, like the, the the amount of shit out there, dude, like when uh what's her face? Uh uh Caitlyn Jenner said there was no that nah, what that Chappelle special wasn't that big a deal. They they described her as 
the credit they gave her was yeah, the Republican. former re Republican governor for California. Like that, so they had, they, they're like trying to shape your, your opinion. It's yeah. like, that's her biggest credit. Yeah, no, it's, it's one thing I've learned, dude. I started to see it early as a kid with like America. They say America loves an underdog. But then once that underdog becomes the fucking favorite, once once that underdog achieves a certain thing, there's like this fascination with the, cr the crumbling and the fucking fall from grace that we have. It's unbelievable, man. And people well, get my, my, my thing is, is if you're going to try to destroy somebody, they should have the right to defend themselves and it should get equal 100%. coverage. And if some people are saying, hey, 100%. this horrific stuff happened, and then the person that's saying it said it didn't, and then suggest that this is actually something else, like that, you know, that this was a hit piece, that should get equal coverage. And then then you can decide, or 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 like, I don't know. I just uh, that's a really kind of uh And it ruins people's fucking lives, man. It ruins it is. If you're gonna go out and you and you're gonna listen, if somebody did something, then yeah, by all means. Of course. You know, they, they, they should be taken out. But, like, the, the, the fact that now you don't even have the right to, like, defend yourself, and even me just saying this, all of a sudden they'll say that, I, you know, it's a rant or something like that, and everybody's supposed to just keep quiet. It's, uh, you know, it, it's really just setting up. Because here's the thing, Paul. Everything, like, there's a hurricane, right? And a bunch of people get displaced. We want to raise money. Who is against that? Nobody, but there's always going to be those people that come in and use that as an opportunity, right? To act like they're helping them out to line their own pockets. Okay. It's, so with all of this, this horrible stuff that men have done to women, who, who doesn't want to stop that? But you also have to understand the world we live in that that's also opens the door yeah. for people to then use that in an underhanded way. And I, I, you know, I really just believe that, that, you know, like I'm saying, like, I wasn't there. I don't know what the fuck happened, but like, I'm just noticing the way they're covering this is, is like, is sort of like this trend that you only can cover one side of like certain stories is and, they're going after these people trying to destroy their lives. Now, Paul, I wouldn't want that to happen to me. I wouldn't even want that to happen to the people that are doing it. That's not what this country's supposed to be about. There, I put my flag down. No, I, I, I agree. And, and I agree with what you said before, too. It's like nobody nobody doesn't want a piece of shit to not go to jail. Nobody doesn't want somebody that that is it treats people like that assaults people. Nobody nobody doesn't want those people to be fucked up. But this idea that you could just put it out there and say it and fucking crumble somebody's fucking whole life and career. With and the way people just run with it. Someone gets accused and then somebody just, someone always writes, and That's I'm surprised it why. It's like, you don't even know this guy. You weren't there. Uh, yeah, and those comedy bloggers, those fucking comedy bloggers that called The Stand, Oh, it's like a fucking white nationalist club. Like, cause like what, cause a comic that does something or says something works there. Oh, it's a safe haven for these. And it's like, no, it's a fucking comedy club. Like, and to do that now, let's say you read a paper and it says that somebody's going to be reserved to go into a fucking comedy club. It's fucking on. You know, what's funny, Paul, the amount of comedy clubs that would not work me in New York city. When I started out, like stop having a temper tantrum figure out how to get in there or maybe there's another road for you to go get into this business dude there was a lot of comics that i saw that had difficult to get into um the uh the clubs in new york and you know some people quit and got bitter other people took different roads i know a guy started writing kids books he got like three or four of those published and now he works on uh one of the big talk shows as a writer that was his way in, but that didn't, you know, it's just like, I mean, doors are going to slam in front of your face before, before they open up way more are going to shut in your lifetime than are going to open. And I don't think that you then have to just sit there and because they're not working you that there's this giant conspiracy, right? Okay. I and it's also like cannibalistic. Like why is, why would you as a comedian go out there and try to like hurt the business of a comedy club because they're not booking you. 
Don't you have any friends that are in there? Don't, don't you at least care about your friends? It's a really, um, this whole trial by internet thing and the way people are just, um, I don't know. I have been shocked at the behavior of, you know, just watching comedians taking out other comedians in situations where they weren't even there. And how about it's this? Like you're not even you're not even there. You don't know anything one way or another, and you're going to try to tip the scales into uh, taking this person. Look, listen, dude. Now I understand. You know, if there's like, you know, like a Cosby thing where there's just like decades and decades and all of these different women and blah blah. I understand that, but I'm talking about like a he said she said thing, or a, a, a um, you know, no, and these fucking comedians, yeah. whatever, whatever these fucking things. It's just like. Wow, man, you're going, you weren't there and you don't know anybody involved here and you're just, you're going to go that hard. It's like, it's, um, it, I don't know. It makes me wonder what's behind it. Yeah. It's like, well, are you real? Like, cause what, what could you base that level of knowing? Cause on all of these things, it's like the only people that really know what happened is like the people that were there. And if you weren't there that. to go that fucking hard, there's got to be something else at play there, right? Well, you know, Bobby Kelly said something that that I I really he said like come come here, we should be like in the mob. You know, you keep your mouth shut about each other. You know, <clears throat> and I don't want to talk bad about some of my peers here, but there are some podcasts that I can't believe these guys are going to sit around and talk about a fucking scandal that a comedian's going through and you're a fucking comedian. And it's like have a little fucking that guy's got a family, have a little fucking respect. You don't know what happened. And the idea that they can call—that's my thing. If you don't know what happened, listen. If you know without a doubt, and someone's a dirtbag, then you know all fucking rules are off. But like, if you have no idea one way or another, you know, and you're just going to start. But at that point, to me, you, you become TMZ. You know, no, TMZ doing, even we even probably has it right more than some of these fucking guys. Well, what they'll do is they'll just sit down and go. So TMZ can get sued, right? So, so like, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about that? Oh, yeah, no. So let's go around. What do you think about that? And it's like, what do I think about it? I think he does what I do and he's got a family and I don't know the fucking facts. So how about we talk about something else? Yeah, and here's the deal, dude. Some of those people that I saw weigh in on those things as hard as they did with no knowledge, if they got accused of something, I wouldn't fucking say anything because I don't know you and I wasn't there. I just love that. And I'm surprised why. It's just the level of ego of that. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, I'm sitting back. I don't need to know anybody involved. I I could have told you that was going to... They're doing the dude I called it. Yeah. <laughs> I saw... I don't, don't want to mention names, but I saw somebody go down or, or not go down, but lose their job. And I was like, this, somebody went on and goes, yeah, you really pinned his ass to the wall. Good. That was great. And it was like, it was so ridiculous and it was so not called for me it's sort of the modern day roman coliseum where they just want to yeah. see people get thrown to the lions you really got to ask yourself why though if you weren't there like listen i want to see justice if justice you know if, if the person did something i'm not saying that but my thing about to just fucking hear an accusation one person and then just throw somebody to the lion's you know, that makes me think like, well, this person is, uh, you know, I don't know. And there's a they, lot they, of pieces they, of shit that are broke that nobody knows that did shit. It's funny how they go after when you get to a certain place, they go, how many guys are sitting back like, fuck, dude, I don't want to get a deal. <laughs> I don't want to fucking get here because <laughs> right? that makes you think like there's a lot of guys because it, it's almost like they wait. And the fact that people were calling up David for about David Portnoy going, Hey, did you ever feel a certain, almost like egging them on or like trying to get something out of them is really fucking gross, man. Really yeah, gross. leading the witness or something. Yeah. I don't think you can do that. Yeah, and it's a pandemic and people's money is, is fucked up. I mean, there's so many variables involved in that. And uh, like I said, I just want, I, you want the right outcome. If somebody did something, you want them to be punished. If they didn't, they shouldn't be punished. And like, I, 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 this whole fucking, yeah, it's like the mob going up to get Frankenstein every fucking week now. I'll be honest. Every with fucking you. week. I'll be honest with you. I love a billionaire. I like a billionaire. That's who I want to fuck. I like millionaires and billionaires. That's it. Just and straight somebody, across the board. Not, you, not, listen, you don't I, care how they got it. No, you don't listen, care how they got it. 
listen, if there's a drug kingpin who was killing, I'm not talking, I'm talking about somebody that worked their way up and is now sitting on a fucking yacht in fucking, you know, it, 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 on the coast somewhere because they fucking did it. And the guy's just crushing life. I fucking love that guy. I want to go to a casino. No, I don't, I don't, I don't begrudge somebody's success. That's, that's a bad look. It's a bad look. Rich Did you see that thing they said about that Tesla dude? They said, this guy has enough money to feed the world. And he goes, okay, give me a plan. And then they shut up. <laughs> no, they said, yeah, they, no, they said if Elon Musk gave like $6 billion or something, he could feed the world. And he goes, all right, I'm going to give you the check for $6 billion, but just lay out in detail what you're going to do and then nothing. <laughs> do you realize how much money it would cost to make sure that that money wasn't stolen before it oh. got to the hungry people? Oh, my God. Yeah, they demonize these rich guys. And, you know, I don't know. They just like, there's only one way to get rich is that you're a complete fucking piece of shit. And it's just like, I mean, that's not true. But I, I think it's, well, yet again, it just makes somebody feel better so Again, i don't i wouldn't like myself dude i would not like myself if it made me feel better just to see somebody get taken out regardless of innocence or guilt just because i didn't like where my life was at and like yeah. that was my my entertainment because the reality is paul in all these cases i hope somebody's innocent because i wouldn't want what they're being accused of to be done to somebody right you know what i mean yeah, no, that it's, uh, I get it. Yeah, it's a fuck. It's a crazy fucking thing. So I'm sure what we but, just said will be fucking taken out of context. But I don't give a shit, dude. Because you know what, what are you gonna do? But I mean, no, I do give a shit. But no, it's not. It's not. It shouldn't be taken out of context. We basically said the pieces of shit should be away. But you gotta fucking you got you gotta really find out facts and find out what's going on before you open your mouth. And you shouldn't have a fucking parade on somebody's fucking crumbling and somebody's fall from grace. You know, and it's a projection. It's a projection of people that aren't motivated. You know, dude, I remember the resentment that I got in the comedy community. Oh, we're letting it all hang out now, Bill. I remember these, the resentment that I got in the comedy community when I was a, uh, I was a young man in my, no, I was in my late twenties, my early twenties and stuff. And I got married and I had kids and I saw comedians treat me different. I always say, I remember this one comedian come up and go, Hey, Verzi, what do you got? Like six kids now. And I was like, no, still two. Just two, but you don't have, you want what I have. You want what I have. Don't fuck ah, me. Ah, don't, do don't do this. Don't do it. Oh, ah, that's me. hilarious. What do you got, like six kids now? Yeah, yeah cause I was like 30, like, 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 like yeah. Sophia, Sophia was just born. Sophia was just born. So I had my son and my daughter. Hey, Verzi, what do you got, like six kids now? And it was like, no, 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 you live in a studio in fucking New York City, and I fucking have you a life. You go home, home to go nothing. Home. Go home to nothing, you fucking nobody. You don't tell yeah, maybe I, yeah. you wish you had six kids. You have no kids, you fucking loser. Oh, I don't care. You know what I mean? And and I and I felt that. I felt no, there's that. nothing wrong with having no kids, but don't fucking... That, I have passive-aggressive shit. Well, I mean, that's, that's something that's for the listeners, dude. You, you can know that. As you work your way up, people, people are going to get weird, Paul. Yeah. They're going to get weird. I told you some stories this week about a guy who got a little fucking weird with me. People just get fucking weird. You told me, you told me, dude, I got to be honest with you, man. Not to fucking, <laughs> not to pat you on the back too much, but dude, everything you've said to me in this business has like oddly just happened in, in the, in it, whether it takes years or months, it's happened. And like you said to me one time, I remember after the special, you go, yeah, dude, there's going to be an adjustment. There's going to be an adjustment for you because more people are going to know you. You kind of leveled up. And I'm going like, what's he talking about, dude? And the special came out and I got more notoriety. And I just fucking, it was like a weird thing. And I, I remember being like, dude, am I have like, you know, and, and you were right about it. But um, it is, it, you know what it comes down to, Bill? It's a projection. Everything is a projection of where people are in their fucking lives. That's really what it is. A lot of times, a lot of times, but I'm not saying, I'm not saying that everything like that broad brush shit is what people have to stop doing. Like sometimes, you know, sometimes it is what they're saying. It is sometimes it isn't. And all I'm saying is that both sides deserve equal coverage. Um, because the, the, the court of public opinion is like, you just, you just let the prosecution talk 
and it's over. And it's just like, I wouldn't want that done to me. I don't want that done to anybody. So what I'm really pleading for here is for people to be a little more rational. And dude, this is not a fucking rational time with, um, you know, just like, first of all, for how long women weren't allowed to come forward or if they came forward, nobody did anything. So that was, you know, was a horrible fucking thing that What's happened. The so you knew liars, that that Huh? What's the penalty for liars? What's the penalty if you do accuse somebody and it didn't happen? Because you know what? I don't find anything happening to those people. I find that person getting- Well, I told you that guy ended up saying something sexist. Dude, I had, I had somebody who, who brands themselves a, uh, a fucking liberal, bleeding heart liberal. The long story, but came in and was just, you know, fucking asking me all these goddamn questions like a jerk off. And at one point they pointed to my father-in-law and goes, who's this? Is this your sober buddy? And I thought about it afterwards. I'm like, well, why did you know? Th- it's my father-in-law. Why did you think that? What? Cause he's black. So you thought immediately he had a substance abuse problem. Yeah. Which is to me, like, I mean, so many of these people, these white people that call themselves liberal, they're so, they, they, they They've, they they labeled themselves woke. They labeled like their credits were given to them by themselves. So um, I really wish I had what a the shit presence, the what presence a shit of mind in that moment. Well, I just wanted to get away from the person. Like they were just like they just had this really negative energy. I just kind of yeah yeah yeah, and I just walked away. And then afterwards, I thought about it. I was like. Sober, buddy. What the fuck did that mean? That, what the fuck? Uh, yeah. What the fuck does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? What do you, And this uh, is a person that is constantly taking people to task about their own fucking behavior. So, oh, Paul. Well, that's what it is. See, you know what? I was trying to enjoy my fucking tea. Okay. I'm a little under the weather. It's my birthday. Sorry. Here's the thing. Here's the fucking thing, man. These fucking, these fucking. Here's the thing, dude. Paul, I got to take you to task. I got to take you to task about something. All right, let me just Put get index this point. finger down. Let me just get this point. Put the so, finger down. So, so I'll point at you. <laughs> I'll point at your square. No, yeah. um, uh, I, I think that a lot of people, like they were saying, like that people that point shit out and call shit out actually have their skeletons in the closet. Like I heard somebody that was talking something about Dave Chappelle special and Dave Chappelle being this and phobic this and all that. And then they looked at one of those pe- persons Twitter and they were saying the most horrible racist shit using words against Asians, the worst words against anything like using the worst slurs against all of these groups. That person was doing it yet. They were the first person out there with a fucking sign and a pitchfork yelling at somebody about their comedy special. So I think there's truth to what you said. I think that people that have their shit like to, I don't think it's always like that. Like, you know, that thing, I always thought it was funny that if somebody has a loud car or a loud motorcycle, they say oh, it's cause they got a little dick. The joke I used to do is like, if I had a little dick, I wouldn't be attracting all this attention. Cause I know how the show's going to end. Yeah. What if he's got a fucking hot <laughs> hey, everybody look at me. Ba, 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 down. I'd fucking pull up on a scooter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you yeah, if you got a big dick, you I would have that. no. If I had a fucking little teeny weeny, I'd have no false advertising whatsoever. I would pull up. Fuck, I would walk there. How'd you get here on foot? All right, what's your axe to grind with me? Let's go. Let's let's. Well, I'm you a, know what? My, I'll tell you what. My my friggin', I didn't think I needed to plug in because I had full charge here. I'm gonna have to plug in my laptop. Okay, it's Mitson in Maine, everybody. Uh, you know, personalized story, Paul, of something that annoys you about uncomfortable dress shirts. I mean, I mean, isn't that a relatable story to everybody who wants to have something riding up into their armpits? You know what I can't stand, Paul, is when you put on a couple of pounds, right? And you got a button down on and you can see the stress. I always say it's like the, the buttons doing the iron cross, <laughs> you know? Or like, you know, you go to take a picture with somebody, you put your arms and you can see like some of your chest poking through because it's not a stretchable, breathable fabric. Um, you know, we have got the amazing, we got the holidays coming up, even more occasions to have to wear a dress shirt. That's why you've got to check out Mizzen 
in Maine. I like that, Paul. It's like an old school thing. Go down there to Mizzen in Maine. Right there in Main Street, downtown. What makes Mizzen and Maine so unique? Mizzen and Maine combines the comfort and flexibility of your favorite athletic wear with the fit and style of a custom dress shirt. Lightweight, breathable, and moisture wicking. This bad boy will have you looking great. Skip the dry cleaner. I love that right there. Skip the dry cleaner. Plus, the dress shirt are machine washable. So you can tri- skip those trips to the dry cleaner. Think of all the time and money you'll save. Uh, on a hot day in Washington, D.C., Mizzen and Maine founder saw a guy running up the hill in a sweat-soaked, wrinkled dress shirt and thought there had to be a better way. He saw that in D.C., probably had the CIA chasing him. Didn't Kevin Costner make a movie about that? No way out. Since then, they've set out to be, uh, to make being comfortable and looking great the new normal. Uh, your full wardrobe. They've gotten uh, famous for their dress shirts, but Mizzen and Maine sounds like a steakhouse, Paul. I love yeah. that name. Now makes incredibly comfortable flannels. No tuck t-shirts. Love those. Performance polos. Chinos and so much more, all in performance fabric with modern tailing. With Miss Paul, you can no matter what you're doing, you're going to be comfortable with Mizzen and Maine. It never Love felt it. better to look your best. What are you golfing? You got a date? Huh? You're a defendant in something you didn't do. You don't want to be sweating there, looking like you're guilty. Get Mizzen and Maine. Thirty thousand reviews. They've got thirty thousand five star reviews, so you know they make a great product. It's nice to have one less thing to worry about because when I wear Mizzen and Maine, Paul, I'm confident. I'm looking my best. This bald so and so looks all right. Whether you're updating your wardrobe to head back to the office or just looking for a new fall flannel, we've got good news right now. To go to Mizzen and Maine. Dot com. Use the promo code BETTER and you'll receive $35 off any regular price order of $125 or more. That's 35 bucks off when you go to M-I-Z-Z-E-N-A-N-D-M-A-I-N dot com. Mizzen, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and A-N-D. Maine, M-A-I-N, sorry, dot com and use our promo code BETTER. They sent me a golf shirt and it is awesome. Um, How'd you shoot? Uh, you know, actually, I broke 100. If I break 100 you these broke days. 100, but you weren't sweating. You looked like you were breaking 80. No, nah, I looked like I was going to the club right afterwards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's paint your life, everybody. If you're looking for a special gift for somebody this holiday season, something truly unique and personal, we've got a great idea for you. At paintyourlife.com. You can have an original painting by a world-class artist done by hand uh, from any photo uh, at an affordable price. If you want to give a truly meaningful gift, you've got to try paintyourlife.com. Get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price. Send any picture, yourself, your children, family, special place, or a cherished pet or combine photos into one painting with Paint Your Life, uh, uh, with Paint Your Life's uh, compilation uh, uh, portraits. You can bring together family members who never had a chance to meet or create a portrait of the whole family (laughs) without the need for anyone to be there. uh, What is it? Anyone to be there for a family photo. Okay. I'm going to bring one of my relatives I never met with, like a Martin Van Buren Buren beard. Yeah, like that's my the, dog who just yeah. passed away. Dude, that would be the weirdest fucking gift. Uh, that would be like just some long dude, lost dude's arm around you. Who is that? That's the guy who haunts this house. Oh my god, Fam- family that's hated each other for years. You just oh, dude. Like, <laughs> oh my god, that'd be fantastic. Like the first dog they ever had is in there. Somebody uh, hates his mother in law. You just have them with their arms around each other like they're besties. Oh my god, <laughs> fucking great. You can rewrite your history. Uh, Here's how the process works. Choose from a team of world-class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. You can order a custom-made hand-painted portrait in less than five minutes. Quick and easy process. Get a hand-painted portrait in about three weeks. Send it to your ex-wife just to annoy her. That's hilarious. (laughs) And you have the animals? Uh, Quick and easy process. Get a, you got the dog in the divorce and he's there. Fuck it. Get, 
Get a hand painted portrait in about three minutes. Meaningful, personal, and you can be che- and it can be cherished forever. It can be cherished forever. Uh, makes the perfect holiday gift for somebody you love or for yourself. Uh, we got one. Me and Stacy got one sent, and it was actually from our wedding. And uh, yeah, it was it was the. the I want to get one of my dog who just passed away. Yeah, for sure. You can oh, do a pers- Leo. You could get a personal uh, personalized one. So here's how it works. Okay, <clears throat> go to anything. Jesus, <clears throat> go to paint your. Paul life Hersey is not a morning guy. We're doing um, this at 10 a.m. And I'm sick. It's brutal. And it's my birthday. Uh, paintyourlife.com. There's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. That's a bold. That's a bold statement. You know, they're going to fucking go out. They're going to paint. There's going to be detail. They're going to get everybody's hair right. And then you're like, what do they do with it when when they send it back? Probably burn them. It's one of those things you just had that creepy thing at a yard sale. Who are Uh, these people? Well, they look happy. (laughs) And right now, guys, right now, for a limited time offer, get 20% off of your painting. Uh, that's right. 20% off and free shipping to get this special offer. Text the word better to 64 dash zero, zero, zero. Okay. That's Dude, you go to send it back. What are they going to do with it? They probably try to talk you out of it. Well, come on. What's wrong with it? You look so happy. That's hilarious. <laughs> so <laughs> Paul, get some more gigs. So people know who you are so we can resell this thing to somebody else. <laughs> is that a cat <laughs> uh that's so funny uh uh hold on this special what offer a you- thing to take back you literally see the I people know. who aren't happy with your product oh it's so funny uh all right sorry let's keep going here no we get the special offer the text the word better guys text the word better to 64 it says sixty four thousand, but there's a dash so it looks like it's 64 dash zero, zero, zero. I'm going to get a couple of my kids. It's a great product. We're just having fun. That's all. No, no better. Yo, text better to 64,000, uh, paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. My ex to grind with you was years ago. We came out here to, to Detroit. All right. And I fucking said to you, man, if I had the fucking money, I would, I, you know, I should start buying real estate out here. You're like, dude, you're out of your mind. That place is never coming back. I was like, I heard them say that about Pittsburgh during my stand-up career. Pittsburgh's beautiful now. Cleveland, Cleveland fucking Ohio came back. And I was looking at Detroit and all of them, they were like, they were like staggered where they were. They were fucking coming back. And now you know what, Paul? Four or five years later, I'm back down here. They're building all these glass towers downtown. I'm sitting in this beautiful fucking hotel. I open my window across the way. There's a bunch of white people sitting in lofts. They don't even have curtains. I'm watching their whole life like I'm in fucking rear window. So, so, um, so you're, okay. So I was wrong. Is that what you're saying? You were dead wrong about Detroit. I, well, first of all, I never said it. I don't. I, first of all, I don't remember the conversation exactly, but I remember you being. Real well, then why home. are you going to defend yourself? You can't even remember it. No, no I, I don't remember it, but I don't think I said that. That's what no, you're going to say. No, no, no. I remember you going, dude. Real estate here, and I just remember me being hesitant, going like, dude, I don't know about that, because you were really gung ho about it. But listen, I love the people of Detroit. I hope it comes back. I'm not trying to. I'm not. I, I'm not trying to say. Just Detroit. say it, Paul. You, your real estate advice. Two thumbs down. Two freckled thumbs down. You know me, dude. I, I want to be in the woods away from everybody. I'm telling you, dude, when I turn... So what does that mean? So I, you would tell me Manhattan's a bad investment? No, but I, I don't want to be there. Ah, but, yeah, ba, ba, da, da. yeah, I hate to say You're that. You're a homer, Paul. You're I hate homer. to say that, but I, I somebody said to me, uh, you know, you don't like L.A.? And I was like, uh, I was like, I don't want to live in New York or LA. I want to be in the country somewhere. Like, I don't want to be in New York City. Hang on a second. I got to make sure I, I'm, I plug in this fucking thing in here so it doesn't go out on me here. Paul, I'm going to be leisure style here. What a beautiful hotel. And this place that Paul Verzi said, that place is never coming back. They're done. 
You talked about Detroit the way you talked about Kansas City. <laughs> Not Kansas City, the Kansas City Chiefs. No, I All right, Paul, I'm on my bed. I'm feeling fucking comfortable. I'm going to talk some shit. Um, Dude, this is, this is laying down as a weird thing. <laughs> Now, what am I supposed to do? No, 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 these no, fucking hotels, they don't have any goddamn plugs anymore. I can try to sit up in bed uh, like no, some no, old no, guy no. about ready to get his soup. Is this better? Uh, this is better. No, I never, but listen, I never said Detroit was a fucking shithole. I never, I just said, I didn't think, I thought you were a little gung ho. Well, you, you were like, you're out of your mind. This place looks like a zombie town. And I'm like, Paul, it's going to come back. I saw Pittsburgh. I saw Cleveland. I saw it. It's really on me. I should have listened to me. Um, Paul, yeah, you see a yeah. fucking split entry in Sydney, Ohio. You're ready to fucking move there. A, a Nordstrom. <laughs> <laughs> we were in a Nordstrom. They got a Macy's. They got a TC fucking yogurt, whatever the fucking things are called. I could live here. I could live here, man. I, lo I love this shit. Um, Detroit people are fucking fantastic, especially your boy there, who I talked to recently. The Detroit, Mike yeah, Mike, but dude, Detroit people, dude, everybody I know from Detroit is just so fucking like blue collar and fucking chill. And um, but what's weird is it's so different from uh, Ohio. And PA and Ohio are so different. You notice that? How PA and Ohio are right there, right there, but they're so different. Like Pennsylvania? The yeah. All right. You freaked me out that you went named the state and then went abbreviations, Paul. My brain isn't that fast. Oh yeah. You know, like, like Joe Ohio and PA. I'm like, P PA. That's Pennsylvania. That's yeah. <clears throat> um Hey Paul, I got I got one for you. I was, I was coming back from uh, San Jose, California, right? And, uh, you know, Southwest flights have been fucked up. I wanted to get home and see my kids. So I was like, fuck it, let's just drive home. And it went great because my daughter went to bed and I wasn't home. When I woke up, she came in to say, you know, hi to, you know, her mom. And she came walking, and it was like Santa Claus was laying there in the bed. She was just like freaked out, jumped in the bed. It was awesome. So anyway, um, we were driving home. We got to Bakersfield, and Club Soda Kenny goes, he goes, hey, this is, uh, this is where the, uh, the Onion Field murders were. Under, onion, onion Field killing was. And I was like, what the hell is that? And he told me this, this really crazy story about how uh, there was these two undercover cops and they pulled over these two guys. They looked, they looked shady or whatever. They pulled them over and uh, they both had guns under the seat. And this guy had this move. What he would do is he would kick the gun out, you know, out from under the seat with his heel, right? And when he went to get out of the car, you could see his hands, but he would back out of the car do this slick little move where he backed out of the car and he fucking grabbed the gun off the floor and pointed at the undercover, had it in his back. And then he said to the other undercover, give me your gun or I'm going to kill this guy. Oh, the, the, the cop with the gun in his back goes, dude, he's, he's got a gun in my back. Give him the gun or something like that. The cop didn't know what to do and he freaked out and he gave him the gun. So then the two guys kidnapped him, put him in the car, they drove him up to Bakersfield, out to this onion field, and one of them thought the little Lindbergh laws, which was Charles Lindbergh's son got kidnapped and killed. He thought he was automatically going to get the death penalty just for kidnapping. But the reality was is he had the law wrong. He had to like do something like ask for money or something like that. So he just got out, gets out of the car and he goes, you hear the Lindbergh Act? Because he told him he was going to let him go. And the cop goes, yeah, and he just shot the guy right in the head. And the other cop freaked out and started taking off. And his club soda, Kenny, always says how difficult it is to hit a moving target. He was zigzagging. They didn't get him. He ran through the fields, found a farmhouse. Long story short, they ended up catching the guys. And um, But that other cop, because he gave up his gun, was ostracized by the other police officers and treated like a coward and all of that. And uh, it totally fucked him up. He started shoplifting because he wanted to go to jail and be punished and shit. 
Wow. Just really ruined the guy's fucking life. It's an incredible story. So there's a movie they made about it with um, James Woods, Ted Danson, one of Ted Danson's first thing. It's on the Criterion channel. Um, my only beef with the movie, you know, aside from I tried to watch it with my wife and it was just, you know, it was bad because every black character is playing like a fucking drug addict, alcoholic, or a prostitute. You know how Hollywood has been forever. So she's like, I'm not watching this shit. Uh, but I sat down and my, my thing was when I watched it was it happened in 1963. This is what a car nerd I am. They were panning the opening shot as they're panning. Clearly show a 65 Impala. I'm like, this shit happened in 1963. What kind of hookup did that guy have that he gets to 65 Impala in March of 1963? Oh, no, wait. Wait. I'm wrong. Because that's later on. And the, 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 the fucking trial kept dragging out because these fucking asshole guys who did it kept appealing it. So they wouldn't be on, and then they got rid of the death penalty, and one of them got actually paroled. It was a fucking joke. That's why they had the 65 in Paula. I was like, how the fuck did they miss that? Sorry. Anyways, check it out. It's called The Onion Field Killing on wow, the Criterion yeah. Channel. Dude, I was just watching. Uh, I was thinking about you, too, because I was watching Narcos Mexico, because I just, you know me. And uh, there was I some- couldn't watch that one because the guy's going to get tortured to death. Yeah, and the El Paso, it was funny because when me and you drove from San Antonio to El Paso, I go, dude, we're going to have something in the car. And you were like, what? And I was like, dude, we should have something in the car. He go, Paul, we're going to be going 80 miles an hour. Uh, but, dude, yeah, some Yeah, shit. Paul thought illegal aliens were going to cross. Mexican illegal aliens were going to cross the border. And their big move was to get all the way, I don't know how many hundreds of miles north, up to the 10 west and to jump onto moving cars at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, anything worse than being sick on your birthday? Uh. I did think of something worse. <laughs> I'm sure there is something worse than being sick. Yeah, no, when you've brought up the border, just seeing these fucking guys that get paid to bring these kids up and they don't even do it. They just take kids and they just drop them over the wall. They probably break their fucking leg and they just leave them there. It's just like, what fucking world do we live in, man? Fucking yeah. world are we living in? Uh, Anyways, with that whole fucking... <laughs> yeah. That happiness. Yeah, no, it's like, it, it's... uh Everything is just like, dude, CNN had a thing where this Don't guy... Don't watch the, any of those channels. No, dude. it was... I didn't watch it. It was on the fucking Twitter feed, and it just said some guy had to flee a blazing fire because the cops were coming, and he left his 19-month-old in the fire, and the guy just fucking ran because the fucking feds came, and it was just like... And I'm just scrolling through, and all I'm right, going... All right. All yeah, right. And I'm going yeah. like, going like, what, what, why, like, what's going on? Like, what's going on? No, my thing is, why do I need to know that? The what? horror of that. That's like when my wife, you know, that, that SNL sketch of, how, sketch of how women like watching those murder shows late at night. My wife, <laughs> my beautiful wife sits there and she watches those things. Dude, I go to bed. I have fucked up dreams. It's, it, you know why, you know why it's so popular? It's, I thought about it. It's because. It's, it's fascinating because it's out there for real. That's what it is. You walk in the mall and you go buy a pair of kicks in the mall, you're probably walking past somebody that either is gonna or has killed somebody or knows somebody who knows somebody that killed somebody. That's what's fucking fascinating about it. So when you read those stories, you There's know- There's a possibility, Paul. That's not that many murderers. No, but- All right, let's look. Andrew, look that up. What percentage of people- Dude, in a you mall, have, dude, you have been, murdered you've, something. No. You've been in a movie theater packed with a guy that's killed somebody. I have absolutely been on the in New York City. I have absolutely got into a cab where a murderer got out, or a hundred percent on the subway. Hundred percent on the subway. Yeah, you've yeah. There's been uh, 
Andrew, how many murders per year in the United States? And this is the guys that don't, these are the guys that get caught. These are the guys that get caught. There's well, you're saying of, how many murders? Hey, you're saying how many murders? Hey, there's a lot of unsolved mysteries out there, okay? <laughs> they made you're not joke. saying how many murderers. You're saying how many murders. Yeah, so yeah. So if you said how many murderers, you'd be like, these are just the guys that got caught. But if you're saying how many murders, that's that's a number. They got that one down. Right. But it's I, probably, I, would, I would imagine it'd be doubled in real life, like with the people that didn't get caught. You think there's twice as many people dead that people don't realize? I mean, there's people that are missing. Dude, they're well, this is dark, Paul. This is a dark podcast, man. Well, no, well, dude, this is your I mean, birthday. Is... Ten years ago, you and me fucking went, worked at the uh, Carnegie Hall. Yes. Yep. And this is the I was gonna say the last four birthdays, me and you smoked a stick. Uh, you were at my surprise party. We did no. Are we gonna do a virtual stick today? Are you sick? I'm sick as a dog. I might have. I either have, dude. I either have COVID or strep. I'm going to find out. It's a fucking mess. You know, what am I going to do? I'm sitting out here. Enjoying. How would you have COVID? I mean, I, I got to go get tested for it with the symptoms I have. I was on an airplane. I don't fucking know. She wore a mask, right? Yeah. Well, you have to. Yeah, of course. I'm, and I'm vaccinated and all that, but I, I don't know if I caught, you know, could be, it could be strep. It could be just a cold, but I got to go check it out. I don't want to get anybody sick. I, I think, I think you're fine. These fucking, I swear to God, man, it's never going to fucking end. Yeah, it is. Dude, they beat, they beat fucking AIDS. It's just going to take a while. And what you have to do is you just have to tune out all of these fucking idiots who have theories, myself included. Tune this out. Just fucking doctors will figure it out. They always have. That's another thing. People are like, oh, yeah, polio is the last good one. It's like, how about the fact that they beat fucking AIDS? They beat it. Dude, some of the strides that we take drugs and it doesn't even show up in your system anymore. And you can fucking have sex with somebody and they can't get it from you. Dude, Magic Johnson, dude. The guy got diagnosed in 91. Look at him now. He's fucking, I think he comes up negative. No, he has for years. He also had the money, but now everybody can afford it. What are we 21, gonna say, million, 21 million uh, total deaths recorded in the uh, homicides recorded in the U.S. in 2020. How many? 20, what? Uh, excuse me, 21,000. Sorry, 21,000. Oh, 21 million. I was like, sorry, Jesus sorry, sorry. Christ. I was, I was looking. And there's still it. traffic? Yeah. Uh, highest uh, was in California, 2,200. Texas, 1,900. And you know what more is people? Yeah, because that fucking state sucks. No, because that state goes from New York City down to Florida. On the West Coast. That's what people don't understand how big this fucking state is. If you look at this, it's actually a lot of it's by size. It's not even by population. Like a lot, a lot of the bigger sized states. So, yeah. So there's been a murderer at your show clapping, laughing. That had, dude, all the theaters you've done, all of the arenas, the theaters, you, there's been a motherfucker out laughing his ass. <laughs> Get, got a beer before the show. Probably Wait, came up and took a picture. <laughs> took a picture, you know, and then he goes back out to he gets in the car, grabs a fucking rusty wrench, goes back to work. <laughs> oh man, it's uh it's really dude, people are fucking sick, man. It's wild, dude. I and and watching those shows makes me just want to fucking hold my kids and just fucking I mean, I get worried about makes that. Makes me want not want to leave. I mean, leave the fucking house. Leave the house. What are you doing for uh what are you doing for the holiday? You were saying you don't like Thanksgiving. Nah, we're gonna do I don't know. What no, kind no. of fucking Italian doesn't like to fucking Thanksgiving? You guys don't throw down? No, me are and you mad uh, that it's based around Turkey? Is that is that too fucking northern yeah. European for you? Me and Bobby Kelly had a screaming match about this. He puts Thanksgiving over Christmas and I just couldn't fucking handle it. So we just went at it. But I just think Christmas is the most special. Dude, Christmas Eve is fucking. First of all, why would you try to convince Bobby Kelly that shopping is better than eating? <laughs> oh, so I got to tell you something. Wait, I want to hear your argument. Why Why is Christmas better than Thanksgiving? Oh, I mean, dude. I'm a holiday guy, Paul. Well, I'm, I'm all in. I should say Halloween, this. Halloween, 
Thanksgiving. Christmas Eve you know what I mean? Christmas. Christmas Eve. I don't know. It's uh, and a lot of people that I talk to, like Mediterraneans, like Italians. Christmas Eve is the shit because it's like the, it's the drinking. It's you know, it's the night before the big man comes to town. I love it. Like, Christmas is a bummer. Christmas Day is kind of a. Bu- it's like it's after. A, it, yeah, it's like. Yeah. It's like I'm. It's like the day you get married, right? You get fucking married, and then it's the next day. It's over, and yeah. it's just like, all right. Yeah, no. And then Christmas. that awful, that awful fucking slow trudge to the end of the year. It's depressing to yeah. fucking New Year's. Christmas Eve is like you have unbelievable, just you know, dirty sex with her. Everything's nuts and fun, and then Christmas morning, it's like, all right. So you want to go to breakfast? Nah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll call you. Like, you know, it's just, but, dude, Christmas Eve, dude, knowing that the big man is coming to town, knowing that the that that, that the fucking reindeer are in the air. I mean, come on. That well, that that. So what you're saying is, the the pregame to Christmas. What's Paul? You're a weird guy, man. What? You always say something. And then by the time you get to the end of it, you, you, you're not, it's not quite what you said. No, because Chris, I mean, Christmas is better. You should have said Christmas Eve. The whole experience of Christmas. Christmas. Well, to I me, thought you were disagreeing with me that, that Christmas Day is a bummer. No, no, no. The whole the Christmas as a holiday is, is the best for me because of the lead up. Because of the lead up. I love that holiday the best. I'm not excited on Thanksgiving Eve. You know why? Because it's disrespect. You're not excited. Thanksgiving evening is the greatest time ever if you're young to be single. You go back to your hometown. You go to the bar. Those uh, All of those chicks you went to high school with, they're all thinking of the guys they should have banged. You're thinking hey, that's a, one of the great fucking hookup nights there ever was. Way better than Christmas Eve. You wake up hungover. You feel like shit. You were out late. That was- oh, you're young. You're young. You feel great. You're, you're, you're grasping for straws, Paul. You're I'm single. Like- you got no fucking kids. You're going back, and you finally got, you got the courage. You got your swag now. You can walk up to that woman you were afraid to walk up to when you were in fucking high school, and maybe something, the excitements of that, Paul, the hope. Waiting for Santa Claus. How about waiting for that fucking chick you've been thinking about for the last seven years to come walking in the bar? That's excitement. Hey, listen, to each his own. I like wearing an ugly sweater, holding a white Russian, enjoying the fucking Christmas movies. Enjoying that sounds the- like a Will Ferrell sketch. <laughs> Yo, I got one for you. So I'm in Houston, and Stacy calls me up, and Stacy says, um, Lucas kind of knew, but I confirmed to Lucas about Santa, and he cried. And I go... I go, well, he, she, I go, what do you mean he kind of knew? She goes, he kind of knew, but like when I told him. So the first thing I said was, what the fuck? Why didn't that happen when I was there? And she was like, she's like the way that it came about, which I get, like it, it got brought up. Now, here's the funniest part. My daughter's nine. Lucas is three years older. So Lucas has had ideas for a couple of years that Santa Claus isn't real, but he's never had one of us actually go, yeah. And that happened, so he got real upset. So then my daughter, so they told my daughter, and because uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Sophia says, "Dad, is that real or not?" And and she goes, I, "I need to know." She goes, "I got I got questions and stuff." And I go, "Listen, the spirit of Christmas is real." I try to get, and my daughter goes like this. She goes, "Dad, I'm going to tell you something right now. I swear to God, it's true." She goes, "If he's not real, I'm going to be pissed." She said that. She actually said that. She goes, "If he's not you real, gotta I'm- come clean." The second my kids go, is, is, it, is it real or not? They know. And just yeah. be like, no, it's just something that you tell little kids. And now you're a, you're a big girl now. You're a big boy now. So Yeah, so when Lucas got so upset. It's so fucking dumb that you start. Believing it? it it's, it's, it's a selfish thing. It's a selfish thing that I'm telling you, I think at some point it's going to end. where you, And then there's going to be a big fight to keep Santa alive or whatever. And it's just like. This whole thing, it's a selfish thing that a parent does. Where you just uh, like seeing your kid excited and you like bringing him joy and you're, you're trying to, and you amp him up so fucking high. That doesn't sound like a selfish thing, though, what you're describing. 
Well, because it is, because you want them to feel those feelings before they get out and find out what the real world is like. Um, Why can't you just level with them? I got a buddy of mine did that. He goes, we're not doing that. They sent him to school with the knowledge. And then they had to kind of give in to the lie because other parents were upset with them. Is, that, is, your buddy the a happy, is your buddy a happy person? No. Well, there you go. It's like, fuck that. That's that isn't where, where you go. That has to do with his fucking life choices, not this stupid Santa Claus shit. You're telling me what brings you happiness in life is telling your kid there's Santa Claus when there isn't? Well, there you go. No, Paul I'm Verzi. Not- we hear it, Paul Verzi Research. No. Deem that argument over. I think it's a nice thing to have your kids, at least until they're five, six years old, like hear the story of it and be excited. Absolutely. But the fucking, I'll tell you, but the fucking, first of all, kids don't give a fuck about Santa Claus anymore. Kids get gifts year round. Yeah, I mean, some, yeah, some. They No, in general, they do. Paul, I'll tell you this. When I was a fucking kid, it's just like, if you were in a big family, it was hand-me-downs. One of my brothers just sent me one of all these fucking pictures from when I was a kid, dude. I'm telling you. There wasn't a picture where I didn't have a patch on my knee. And the thing is, it didn't even, it was just a patch. Like I had like on red fucking tough skins with a big black patch over one of them. I'm sitting there. I got fucking those boondockers, the old fucking work boots. They're worn out, Paul. Worn out on the sole. I remember you would get, you'd get one pair of sneakers in September and you didn't, and she, my mother would buy them like a size too big or whatever. And then you would just wear those things until September the next year. That was it. Yeah, it's a, the, the a couple kids pairs of smart. pants, a couple shirts, maybe. And then it was just hand me downs. I remember I used to eyeball, you know, you'd eyeball your oldest sibling's clothes, going, "I can't wait to get that shirt." <laughs> wow, dude, my family album. You, you'll see a shirt pass through the whole fucking family. <laughs> yeah, and now and now our kids get dude. Like my son went to Madison Square Garden so many times that when I like to surprise him after school, go guess where we're going today, and he'll go what? I go you're out of school early. We're we're going to Madison Square Garden. We're gonna go see the and like when it, it happened the first. Now he's just like yo, that's awesome. Like and I'm like dude, he used to like melt, and now it's like yeah, he gets sneakers. you're doing it too much, dude. You know yeah. what that's like? That's yeah. like complimenting your wife too much. You tell her you love her all the time, it doesn't fucking mean anything. You're buying them gifts all the time, they don't give a shit. You, you know, the same way if, like, you know, every day you fucking came home, if, if they blew you, Paul. Dude, I fucking told her she looked pretty the other day. I was waiting for you to be like, well, I don't think I'd ever get sick of that. No, no, I uh, <laughs> have at it, okay? No, um, I, I, uh, I say to her all the time, I say to my wife, like, when she comes downstairs, I'll be like, man, you look pretty, man. Oh, you look beautiful. And, like, you know? So now, you know, she can't say, like, and I don't do I sent her flowers the other day, bought her flowers. She was having a bad day. She was upset. So I went, I got these flowers. I brought it in. And it's like, it's like, yeah, yeah. So don't say that I don't do that because I do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> No, don't, you know what I think about you, Paul? What? You just you the you present the worst arguments. No, you you you're right. You're so right. It's like yeah, don't say don't do that because I did that. Like your your case is so strong, but your argument is so weak. Yeah, because you like know- Paul, that is the alley oop slam dunk. Everyone in the garden comes to their feet, and you, you re- by the time you describe it, you reduce it to a free throw. <laughs> no, man, like, she can never say you that. Know, I come home, I tell her she's beautiful, I give her flowers, you know? So I do that. So, you know, don't say I don't do that. <laughs> After defending the spirit of Christmas... Like, oh, it's the thought that counts. You're like, well, it's almost like saying, well, your kids can never say that you didn't tell them there was a Santa Claus. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, Paul, I got to tell you this. I think Thanksgiving is, is disrespected. All right. I think Halloween has two things going for it. The gay community 
And then women, it gives them excuse to dress a little more, you know, you know, a little more racier than they would. And then kids love it. So you got a three-pronged attack on people that love it and elevate it. Elevate it. I mean, Halloween is almost a gay holiday. The way the way that they they I mean they crush it. They fucking they fucking they they elevate that whole fucking holiday and everybody else is drafting behind them. And then you got Christmas. But then Thanksgiving is this great thing where you can fucking hang out. There's no pressure. You don't have to buy anybody anything. And then the greatest hookup night of the fucking year is the, the night before. A lot of great drinking happens. And then after Thanksgiving's over, you still got a three-day fucking... It's a four-day weekend. It's a four-day fucking weekend, Paul. A lot of people, the day after Christmas, they have to go to work. You get a four-day fucking weekend, and then you still have the excitement that your Christmas, your Hanukkah, your Kwanzaa, whatever, is still coming. Yeah, I mean, listen, I hear those points. I like giving. I like pay- I like giving gifts. I love giving gifts. I like giving gi- gifts better than I like receiving them, and that's the truth. You get me one or two nice things, I appreciate it. I love You watching- like shopping. I love watching people open shit that they love. Don't avoid the question. What? What's Do you the- like shopping? No, I don't know. I'm not a big shopper, but I like because I go in like a sniper. So that, that, that's in that's okay. So that's in the negative side of the ledger there. Yeah, like I I go in like a sniper, but I like to get what you want. So if let's just say if I knew you wanted a pair of sneakers and I got them for you and I gave them to you, oh I love it. You know when I made you that cheap. So you're telling me you have no imagination. What do you mean? No, I no, someone no, no. just says I want this and then you go out like a sniper and buy it. With my wife, I have a magic. So what you're basically is your postmates with no, gifts. No, and I'll tell you another thing I do. I'll tell you another thing. Well, let me ask thing you this. Let me ask you this. Paul, I'm not going to try to convince you. I get it. You like Christmas better. No, but. But here's my thing. This is, my, this is what, what it fucking annoys me about my wife. My wife goes, I want that. And then if I just go out and get it for. Her, yeah. It's like I ran an errand. Yeah, but you got to do that and then throw your original thing too. That's the way to do it. You get their list and then you put a little fucking, then you put a little something that you got. But you know what I don't do? I don't do Amazon. I, I don't like a list, Paul. And don't I don't do like Amazon. a list. Don't do Amazon. All these people fucking shop at Amazon. Go to the fucking store. That's another thing I don't do. These lazy fucking people just do their Christmas shopping like this. Well, you find me a fucking store that's still open. Where's Toys R Us? It went under. Where's know, Child crazy. World? It's gone. Me and Brett Ernst were talking about that. Toys R Us going under is brutal. Fucking brutal, man. Well, you guys are youngsters. Child World was the best. Yeah, There's that's a- no other world like Child World. It's a hap, hap, happy, happy store with miles and miles and toys for happy girls and boys and much, 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 much more. That's fantastic. That's like Christmas. World's there, biggest toy store, bitch. Toys R Us. The biggest selection, Toys R Us. And here's that the was other before thing. they came up with their dumb mascots. Here's you know what I like about Child the World? They had fucking kids up on the side, not a couple of stupid fucking giraffes. What do I care about these fucking giraffes? They changed it to I the saw panda. happy kids on that. That's what I wanted to be. Yeah, Child World had the panda at the end. And they were white kids, Paul. <laughs> I just realized if they were still around, they'd have to have their sign be a little more inclusive. It's like, what? People who don't have white kids can't shop here? But bring up the Child World sign if you can find one. I think it was a little white boy and a little white girl. Oh, shit. That, that, that was be- it. There'd be there'd be fucking protests outside a child world. <laughs> they would. Um, listen, dude. Well, that's a say- good thing, though, Paul. They should, everybody should feel like I, somebody said one of the saddest fucking things. So when they read about the history of this country, they feel like it's not their own country and that they shouldn't. They don't want people don't want them to be here. Can you imagine feeling like that? And this is a natural born citizen in this country. So I'm I'm not against you know Paul. You know, if Child World comes back, I would be all for, you know, got to get everybody up there, Paul. If I read, if I read that it didn't feel like I belonged, I honestly wouldn't give a fuck. 
I don't think I would be like, all right, I'm here though. Like, cause didn't the Irish and Italians go through all that shit too? Like they would just look oh, at it. Paul, don't present that stupid white argument. <laughs> No, no, I'm not. I'm not arguing away. Hey, the fucking potato famine. Remember, I mean, that was that. It's, oh yeah, that's kind of like slavery. I, just, um, I, 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 I see. I can see how that exists on the lateral plane. Um, another thing, Bill. You got stuffing, turkey, cranberry sauce, and then a couple of people put their twist on things. But that's the meal every time. Christmas, you can change it up a little bit more. You know, some people like to do it. Nah, that's dinner. not true, Paul. That's not true. What do you mean? You have the same thing on Christmas every year? No. First of all, well, first of all, people have their traditions. And then what it is, Paul, is as you, you know, everybody brings something. Right. So as long as you don't have the same fucking people every year, and you bring something different, everybody's going to have, like, what, what they bring. I don't. You have you have different people coming in. We have the same people. Ever you have different people coming in every year for Thanksgiving? Yeah, I mean, it's fucking L.A., man. People come in, they come out. But I do like you know. I I try to do something different every year. I mean, you have the basic, Paul. And yeah. when our, in our house, like we had prime, we used to have prime rib. And this year, I was thinking of maybe having a goose because we were supposed to have a Christmas goose. I'm like, all right, I'll have a fucking. Let's try to do a goose. Yeah, that's something nice. different. I don't I don't want the same thing, but I'll tell you this, Paul. If you ever had my stuffing, you would drop the fork and you would put a hole in my wall and I wouldn't charge you for it cuz I know it's that good. I I dude, I love stuff. I actually I this stuffing usually you just put it in the bird. But everybody likes how the outside gets crusted and there's also never enough. So I actually make a double order every year. My wife is always on me. You going to have enough stuff in there for leftovers too? Because she wants to have them like her favorite thing. Oh, dude, are you kidding me? Thanksgiving, me and my wife start throwing down in the kitchen. I tape the football games because we watch, she watches the Macy Day Parade. And then she watch, we watch the Westminster Dog Show. And for two years in a row, we called the winner. And then last year we missed it. But I called the Bloodhound, and there was another one the year before that. I got that one, or the year after. And then maybe the last couple of years I haven't been able to pick the winner. And that's like our little tradition. We get some fucking eggnog, little brandy in my wife's. You know, I don't, I don't mess with that shit anymore because I can't handle it. But, um, dude, that night we get the fire going, and then that's the first night the Christmas lights go on on the house. And it just begins it. And you have all of this time of the Christmas season. I'm going to take my kids skating this year. You have all of that fucking excitement. And then, dude, Christmas, it's like the last day of summer. And then you got to go back to school the next day. So I like, I do like Christmas Eve. Love Christmas Eve. But like Christmas Eve to me is an extension of Thanksgiving where it is the it's you're in the holiday season yeah all right the f new year's eve is the spinoff from like the fucking hit sitcom and then they try to fucking you know it's like you had alice and then they tried to give Flo a show and it didn't work yeah right yeah. nobody gives a fuck about it yeah that i could buy i like that that's true new year's eve is like the new year's eve is like whatever but what I like about Christmas is the the music, the songs, the lead up, the shopping. I like the anticipation. Yeah, but of it. Paul, you get that from Thanksgiving evening on. You got the whole thing. Christmas Eve, Paul, to me, there's a sadness to it because I know it's all going to be 24 hours. It's over. The wrapping paper is done. Now you're looking at all this shit you got to take down. Oh my god! And then the saddest thing ever: taking your fucking tree out. Cutting the thing up like you committed a fucking murder and you're stuffing it into recycling. Body. Like you're dragging out a dead body? Yeah, dude. I That's love good. Christmas, too, and I love the music and all that, and I love the excitement of the kids, but there's a sadness to it that it's over, and then the dread of another year of working and trying to keep the weight off and flat earthers telling you what the fuck to do and just, oh, my God. 
fucking liberals screaming about all of this shit. It's just, it's, it's going to be another year of this. Um, what's funny is when, when, uh, my son found out there was no Santa, I went, I came home from Houston and I go, Hey buddy, you, uh, you know, you, you found out no Santa. And, and I go, and he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm all right. You know? And I go, all right. I go, what, and what about your sister? Did you confirm with her? And he goes, yeah, she said like she knew two years ago and didn't care. <laughs> That's like my daughter fucking my daughter sniffed that out like the Sicilian that she is. She fucking was asking questions two years ago. Lucas has that innocence where he just was like devastated. And my daughter was like, I well, no, he also he did. She had the advantage of having an older sibling, too. Yeah, that's true. That's they, true. They, they come up quicker. Well, here's so, the like my son. My son's hilarious right now. Like he wants to do everything that his big sister's doing. So, like, he sees her walk up the stairs, so he won't crawl up him anymore. He grabs onto the banister, and he will walk up. But the funny thing is, is when he first learned how to do it, he would put such an emphatic foot down on the first one. He would lift it up, and his foot would go, boom, like, right on it. And then he, like, works his way up. Dude, he's strong as hell, man. Dude, he has me going like this. When he gets mad... When he gets upset, he throws himself back and he just slams both his <laughs> hands down onto you. I love it. I just, yeah, it's just like, no, he, he, I told you he was at the park and some kid tried to take the toy away from him and he yanked it back and he gave the kid a smack. I've That's never so been, I mean, that was one of the highlights yeah, that's the best. I actually had my best night as a parent, I, I, as far as like with my wife two nights ago. My son woke up, he was crying. And we went in there and he, uh, my wife went in, he said, he's burning up, he's burning up. He's like teething or something. Or my daughter brought something home that she could fight off and he couldn't. And he was just miserable. And, uh, you know, ended up taking him out of the sleep sack. He just had his diaper on. You put the washcloth on him, cooling him off, gave him a little Tylenol. And uh, we just stayed in the bed with him. And because he was so hot, our bodies were cool to him. So he just snuggled up together with us. You know, we we're like fuck half asleep, but we were like a total team. And like the next day, I, I texted my wife, told her how proud I was that she was the mother of my kids and she crushed it. And she goes, you know, I was just about ready to say the same thing to you. And part of me wanted to be like, yeah, well, why didn't you? Why did I have to say it first? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> No, but it was. It was like we we absolutely we totally worked together. Nobody bitched, even though it was like three in the morning, and comforted him. We got the fever to come down, and uh, you know, you know, it's our second kid, so we weren't freaking out as much. Like you know, yeah. we were able to sort of you know ride the storm together. It was good. It's a no, good night. It's the best, man. And the best is like having those kids, like I was going to say, at least whatever season you love, whatever holiday you love, at least it's the holiday fucking season, dude. Like it is like time to be home. I took December off. I got a couple more shows for the year. Oh, Verzi knows how to live. Yeah, you got to. You know, you I gotta, text my agent right after you told me that your last gig is right before Thanksgiving. You're not working for us here. I said, I want to do that next year. Guess what I got back? What? Silence. <laughs> he never responded. That's fucking great. Dude, these agents are trying to do what the oil companies are doing. The only reason why gas right now is five, six dollars a fucking gallon. Okay, the only reason why it's five, six dollars a fucking gallon right now is because they didn't make any money last year. Nobody drove last year, really. There should be an abundance of crude oil. It should be like like fucking two dollars a gallon, and instead they're just doubling up, and they don't give a fuck how much money the regular person lost. And, and, and is anybody giving them shit, Paul? No, I'm gonna do a bit about that tonight. Cause you remember the fucking hand sanitizer kid? Remember that kid? He shorted the market on hand sanitizer. It was one of the most brilliant fucking dude I called it moves ever. He got shamed on the news. He had a whole garage full of it. He was selling it for like fucking eight bucks a whack on the internet. They fucking trash him. Take him out. Right? And he had a garage full. He was fucking over a garage full of people. These people are fucking over the goddamn world. 
What? Let me ask you a question. One of the most trying times economically ever, and nobody is saying a fucking word to them because they run shit. They run CNN. They run Fox. They run Washington D.C. Well, dude, that's why. They run the whole fucking thing. I'm not paying five dollars a gallon or four dollars a gallon. That's why I'm going to get an electric car because I'm not doing it. Well, we shut. They'll figure it out, Paul. Listen, this is what I've said from the beginning. This is blue blood fucking money. You got to give those people the sun and just say that we're going electric and you guys can have the sun and you can make big threats that you're going to shut the sun off and we'll act like we believe it. Like that'll be our Santa Claus. And we'll just give that to you so you can keep getting your fucking money because they're so fucking wound up on making a buck. They just, they, they have just, I love how all of these people just denied global warming, greenhouse gases, all of that shit climate change, whatever the fuck you call it. And now it's just like, yeah, okay, it's happening. But, you know, it, you know, there's this and there's that and the fucking... It's like, no, you guys denied this for fucking... They've been denying it, Paul, since the 1950s. They've known about this shit, Paul, since the 1950s. Going on all, the better part of, of, of almost 70 years, they've had time to not get ourselves into this fucking situation where Miami's going to be under the ocean. It's well, unreal. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rely on fucking gas anymore because I'm sick and tired of one president's in, the gas does this. Another president's in, the gas does that. You got to fucking stop here. Get it has gas. nothing to do with the president, Paul. That's, that's just their fucking distraction to get no, mad at colors of ties, Paul. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying I'm not going to worry about the price of gas anymore when I go electric, and that's what I want to oh, do. But you brought up the president, because right now, people are looking at gas prices, and then they say the dumb shit, Joe Biden's America. And the bottom line is, is if Trump was in office, the exact fucking opposite people would be going, yeah, you can thank your boy Donnie Trump for that. And it's like, those guys, dude, I, they, they, they're like this big to a fucking oil company. They, yeah. call, they call him up. I don't give a fuck. He's in the shower. Get him on the phone. And he's got to walk out with his little presidential towel with his fucking initials on it. 42nd president wrapped around his fucking goddamn fucking 80 year old waist. Uh, that's great. Go. Is somebody there writing this down so you can remember it? This is what's going to happen over the next six months. That's how, that's how it happens. Dude, that just reminded me of when I stayed in Jimmy Carter's suite. I stayed in Jimmy Carter's room with my wife and that's how my daughter how fucking hilarious is that we were in his suite she goes oh you're you staying in the white in house no i was staying in jimmy carter's suite where uh where he stays on um in mr connecticut and it was his it was his room when he went there and dude it was presidential we went in there she was oh you know the room they gave you i was doing a gig and dude you had to walk upstairs and then go downstairs into the bathtub and this shit was fucking nuts. And it was like president. That's why Jimmy Carter is the greatest president ever. It was nuts. Because he's such a down-to-earth guy that Paul Verzi can stay in the room he stayed in and have himself a good night. And I'm laying. And Jimmy Carter is the greatest, is, is the only human being, I've like 100% human being, good person. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I got to finish this, though. I got I to gotta finish telling you this. So my son is in a bassinet. He's in a playpen at the foot of the bed sleeping. He's like two and a half and Stacy and I are laying in bed and I'm in this, I'm in Jimmy Carter's fucking cr like pad. And, uh, the desk was all like fucking presidential it was great. And I'm laying in there and like, I woke up at like three in the morning. And I'm like, like, dude, I gotta, it's like, I gotta fucking have sex with my wife in this joint. Right. Like I'm in Jimmy Carter's suite. <laughs> just woke her up. It's like I had to fuck, you know, we gotta do something to Jimmy Carter's fucking joint. Can you can you please tell me something? What makes a desk presidential? If you saw it, I think if you saw it, you would you would know. I know. I just want to hear like what what in the Paul Verzi brain made you look at that and be like it was just so it was like this like unbelievable, beautiful, like shiny mahogany wood with these like gold handles. <laughs> like the like the like the hand, like it, it looked like some shit that should be in the Oval Office. Uh, uh, dude, the, the whole fucking room, man. I got to find pictures of it. But uh, I was like, yeah, dude, I got to fuck my wife in this room. I'm sorry. I got to, you know, what am I going to do? So was it sleek? Because I was picturing a big FDR 
wooden desk where you couldn't see that he was in a wheelchair. He was sitting behind it. No, you remember was, they, used, they used to try to hide that. They used no, to try yeah. to hide that because they didn't want people to think that, you know, the guy, you know, was weak or something. It, it wasn't sleek, but it wasn't like really like bulky. It just was like really, it was really nice, but you could tell it was like some, some 19, like it was probably like ball. Jimmy Carter is in his nineties. He's still out there swinging a hammer, building homes for people that need it. Homeless people. Everybody else goes on the speech tour. You know, and they go out and they give speeches. Who do they give speeches to, Paul? You and me? No, they go out to the people that gave them money to get into the off. They're just washing their bribe money. Rather than just going, hey, man, here's fucking two, three hundred grand for fucking hooking us up over the last 48 years. They go out and they give a speech. I used to do a bit about that in my act, and no one in the crowd's listening. They're just sitting there eating like a deep-fried eagle, you know, just... <laughs> some endangered species and then they just fucking give them the money and then they all go buy a mansion on like martha's vineyard you know jimmy carter's favorite holiday christmas labor day <laughs> what <laughs> labor day oh man i don't do i gotta go with bobby kelly christmas is the end of the summer yeah, I mean, I like, like the whole build. Up. Here's something. Hey, we can meet in the middle here. I think underrated, and what a lot of people don't do, like Halloween is Halloween, and then you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait, and and then then this Thanksgiving, and then you deal with all this stress of fucking you know Christmas shopping and all that, and then Christmas, and then it's fucking over. You should be, I feel like, a few days before Halloween. You should fucking get in the festive thing. Like I'm coming home this week and I'm making, uh, I make this cream pie that everybody fucking loves. And like, what, I'm going to wait till Thanksgiving. I think that there should be some of that stuff. Another underrated thing, Thanksgiving decorations. A lot of people don't like them. Browns and oranges and shit like that. Or mind you, leaves dying and shit like that. You got to do something, Paul. Throw that fucking bale of hay right in your foyer as you walk in. Let people know the goddamn turkey's oh. only got a couple of days left. No, my house is filled with it right now. My house is filled with thankful pilgrims everywhere. The fuck the whole thing. My wife does everything. That's what you don't like. Pil pilgrims don't look Sicilian or Greek. Does that bug you? Fucking Christopher Columbus was the first guy who fucking came over here. Huh? Where the yeah. fuck is he in these Thanksgiving direct? You don't see any Italian pilgrims. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It put some sauce what is that made out of bird. fucking wood? I ain't getting on put that some, thing. Let me know when you got fiberglass. Oh! Put some fucking regard in that bird. What the fuck? You got olive oil? <laughs> put some sauce in that fucking bird. I'll fucking... I'll... <laughs> hey, not for nothing. That meat's a little dry, no? Dude, that turkey parmesan wedge was incredible for leftovers. Hey, maybe, maybe if you didn't overcook the bird, you wouldn't need to pour all that fucking gravy on it. You can't re-moisturize meat. Once it's dry, it's fucking dry. Oh, potato, potato. Give me a fucking octopus. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, no, dude. Like, I, I, I got into an argument with somebody in the family because I was like, can we have macaroni and cheese for Thanksgiving? And they were like, no. And I was like, what? And I was like, you can I go, what do you mean? You can't fucking make, put macaroni and cheese as one of the sides. So they said, no, that's not really tradition. So I did it. I started making it. Started making macaroni and cheese. Well, that's the great thing, Paul. Yeah. It's, it's, you can make it whatever you want. My wife, she, she has a mac and cheese, collard greens, all that shit. A white guy like me, I didn't know anything about that. Now I love it. So that's all part of it. We got the whole thing going on, Paul. Dude, how we great. Got the white boy fucking Thanksgiving with Nia's African American shit. It's fucking amazing. Dude, is any is there anything? I got better a cream pie. Nice? I got a sweet potato pie. Huh? We got stuffing. We got collard greens. It's just we got a fucking everything. What do you want, Paul? What do you want? I want. I want fuck. Is anything better than mac and cheese, dude? A good mac and cheese. Oh, dude, I'll get to you right now, Paul. A good Another mac one. and cheese. You got to have my wife's nice. mac and cheese. My wife goes out to restaurants. She's a mac and cheese snob. Good. I'm she trying to think. Of, I am trying to think. <laughs> 
They stink. They I'm stink. trying to think the last time my wife went out and had mac and cheese. The best these people get, it's not bad. It's not bad. My wife does a three cheese mac and cheese and browns up the top, Paul. It, it brings a tear to your eye. Is it creamy in the middle or no? Are you kidding me, Paul? I'm insulted you even asked me that. It has to be creamy. It's the surf and turf. You've got the crust on top with the creamy. Paul, there's three different cheeses in there. How the fuck is it not going to be creamy? No, sometimes people fucking make it dry. I'm telling you, nine out of ten mac and cheeses stink. Nine out oh, of yeah, ten. Oh, yeah, the whole. Yeah, no. They're over the, it's like scrambled eggs. Yeah. They should be a little runny. You don't want to fucking all just cook to shit. You got to do it the French style. I asked for the over. French make the best scrambled eggs on the planet. Why? And why is that? Oh, because they're artists, Paul. Because they're along the Mediterranean. All of you guys, the Greeks, the Italians, the yeah, French. Yeah, but what about a scrambled Spanish. egg? What about a scrambled egg can be better than a scrambled egg? If it's cooked Exactly, right. Paul. Exactly, Paul. Because you're fucking Italian and Greek. You never give it up to the French. What? <laughs> what? I just never had a... Paul, you went to Paris. Paul goes, I, I didn't like Paris. No, no, I didn't. I didn't like. He said, "I didn't like." I never heard anybody say that in my life. No, I was. I only went. No, I only, that was that me because I only went to the airport. I don't think that you was me. You told me I didn't like Paris. I never been to Paris. Then why would you say that to me? Was it? Well, are you sure it was me? Because I only been to the airport there on a layover. I'm positive it was you. No, then that doesn't. I'm gonna start calling you Pauly Pauly Big Statement. That's like, that's, make a big statement, yeah. and then you fucking walk it down. No, but I couldn't have said that. I mean, if I said that, that wouldn't make sense because I was in the, only at the airport. So I don't know where I would say that from, honestly. Unless I was drunk fucking around, I don't know where I would say that from. But no, no. I'm probably talking Italian versus France. What I'm telling you right now, okay. French food is fucking off the chain. The only argument I can say is, is it's really rich. But the thing is, is the quality of it. Like if you made a French meal over here, man, like you wouldn't feel good afterwards because our fucking, our because our food is fucking poison now, Paul. But that's not a story. That's not a story, but a stand-up comedian's fucking act is. Figure that one out. So Great over there, dude, you have that, and you have a little glass of wine afterwards. You're fucking good. You can't believe it. That it's it's their food is fucking incredible. All of the food from from Israel, all the fucking way across. Where I've been along the Mediterranean is some of the best food on the on the planet. I think Middle Eastern food. I no think disrespect to the Palestinians. I wasn't there long enough to have any of your guys' food, dude. It's great. I don't sure. want to start that shit up again. Because no. I went over there and the whole fucking place was beautiful and it was it was see, typical shit. Why are people fighting over here? Beautiful people. Dude, Palestinian and Israeli women, fucking gorgeous when I was over there. Food was incredible. Me and fucking Bartnick just dropped in there. Don't have a dog in the fight. Well, you know, I always go for the underdog. Just sitting there smoking a stick going like, I fucking... What are they fighting about over here? People probably do that when they come to America. They see how fucking big it is and all the bullshit that we're doing. And then life goes by, Paul. Life goes by like the holiday season. And next thing you know, it's Christmas Eve. Look at me tying it all up here in a bowl. That's, for that's Christmas why I'm. Eve that's ball. why I'm. I'm just. I'm. That's why I'm just happy. Because we're all gonna die. I'm a happy guy, man. You got to be happy. You know what I love about you, Paul, is you are a happy guy. I've actually become a happier person observing you. It how gives me not- joy to see how happy you are. How could you live this life knowing you're gonna die unhappy? Well, Paul, there's a lot of variables. We are a couple of white guys, so we were kind of starting pretty good here, no? I mean, look, I'm talking about Paul, knowing. You, you know how annoying God. TSA is? I, I always look that the only way white people can relate to racism is if every experience was like going through TSA. <laughs> there's some guy in a fucking uniform just breaking your fucking balls. And you're sitting there in your head going, I'm not a fucking terrorist. Why is this taking fucking 45 minutes longer than it should? <laughs> I had drugs in my bag and TSA was going through it, dude. And I was really fucking nervous. I, um, I did Skank Fest and somebody put, gave me weed. 
and they put it in my bag and I put the thing through the, they went through the thing. And I swear to God, dude, this black dude, I'm not even joking. This black dude was, fu- I'm not even exaggerating for the, to, for the podcast to be funny. This black dude was Steve Urkel, man. This black dude came. I, I, I almost thought he was fucking with people. He had glasses and he just goes, uh, excuse me, Sarah, is this your bag? Uh, dude, I'm not even fucking around. And I go, I go, yeah, he goes, and he goes, all right, you're going to have to grab your stuff and walk around, dude. And like, at first, a couple of people started like chuckling and like snickering. And I'm going, dude, is this guy like, like he didn't look, it was fucking wild. And he goes, no, but aren't you freaking out? Like I got weed in there or were yes. you? Did you yeah, forget? no, no. I was like, I was like, fuck dude. I got weed in there, man. And I was like, I never, I never had this happen. I just want to get home. And uh, I start grabbing my jacket and he goes, sir, do you mind not doing that in front of people? That's not safe. And then that's when I fucking laughed and I walked around and I'm going, oh, fuck. And he opens the thing and he takes my fucking sweatshirt out and I'm just going, fuck, dude, I swear to God. And then he takes the skank fest like gift bag that you get, which had like a yearbook and goodies and a flask and a pen and a coaster. And that's where like the weed was, I guess. And he's just looking through it. And I swear to God, I, I felt like I was into a fucking narcos. And he just goes, ah, that's nothing. And he fucking put everything back and he fucking zipped it. And then as he zipped it, I go, hey, man, thanks for being so fast because I needed to catch my flight. And he was like, no problem. And I felt like when he said no problem, it, it got less nerdy. So I was like, dude, I didn't know if the guy was joking or not, but I, I don't think he was because he was like taking it real seriously. It was fucking hilarious, dude. He goes, that's not safe. I was like, dude, it was out of a movie. I was like, imagine. I think the scariest, scariest I've been was when we went into Singapore. And I was grilling my wife. About what? Weed. Oh. Do you know those fucking weed people? They're always like, they're always finding joints and forgetting they had something. Uh, oh, I got a fucking cookie here. I forgot I fucking put this here. You fucking shaking the hair out. Yeah, that's the last one. <laughs> and the diamond comes out. Remember that? In casino? Yeah, yeah. That's the last one, huh? It's very smart. That's yeah. the last he gives her a fucking smack. Yeah. And I was like, like, I don't want to get caned or get the death penalty. Like, I think we were in New Zealand first before we went to Singapore, which by the way, dude, Singapore fucking airlines. I'm going to tell you this right now. All of the airlines in Asia put our airlines to shame. (laughs) Dude, smoking hot stewardesses still. You can't call like them stewardesses, it was Bill. You can't call them stewardesses, Bill. Where's your sensitivity, Bill? They're I can call these ones stewardesses because they're fucking hot. <laughs> the second they all became flight attendants, the number just dipped. <laughs> Bitches got fat and shit. Yeah, stewardesses. Yeah, everybody got grumpy on the plane. They added extra rows. They jam-packed everybody in. Next thing you know, somebody's taking a shit on the fucking food. You know what guy did that? What? He, he got banned for life. And it's the story's been scrubbed from the internet because he's a really rich guy. He got so fucking shit-faced and entitled. White guy, of course. <laughs> I don't know what happened. They shut him off. He dropped a deuce on the food cart. What? Pulled his pants down and shat in front of everybody on the food cart. What? It's a true fucking story. You can't find... I remember all the morning radio stations were doing physically it. physically possible. How is that physically possible? Because the, who's stopping them? All you're trying to do is get out of the fucking way. You know, the person pushing the food cart, somebody fucking pulls their fucking pants down, Seth's going, you're just backing up. You are backing the fuck up. Can I read this story real quick? It's Yes, uh, did you find it? In 1996, February 12th, uh, an investment banker accused of defecating on an airliner's food service cart during a flight pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of threatening a flight attendant and agreed to pay 50000 in restitution. His lawyer said his only problem <laughs> was diarrhea. <laughs> well, I was very angry. <laughs> Quote, I was very angry, said uh, Gerard 
uh, B. Finnerin, 52. Uh, he told uh, the magistrate the judge, uh, he also admitted to making a threat aboard United Flights, uh, United Airlines flight from Buenos Aires to New York on October 20th. A managing director of a trust company in the uh, of the West who lives in an upscale Greenwich, Connecticut house uh, faces up to six months jail and fifty uh, five thousand dollars fine uh, when he was sentenced. Dude, your life is over. There's no way to apologize. There's no way to redeem yourself as a person. That guy now he's fifty two and ninety six. So that was uh, 25 years ago. He's 77 if he's still alive. And I bet he still sits on his porch. I bet his neighbors never looked at him the same. Oh, my Bro, God. Talk about a slap on the wrist. That is some. That is the pre-9-11 America that I grew up in. That uh. you could take a shit on a fucking cart on an airplane and make threats, not be arrested. He, he told the judge... Uh that he had no intentions of carrying out his threat, but badly wanted another glass of wine after the airline uh, had stopped serving alcohol. I became annoyed and said words that implied a physical threat. Asked if he told the attendant he would bust his ass, uh, Finneran said that uh, he assumed that he had something, uh, t said something to that effect. Authorities had alleged in court papers that he started pouring drinks on himself during the flight, uh, and had threatened one uh, flight attendant and shoved another into, into a seat. Jesus. Dude, you know how fucking hammered you got to be? Right. The lawyer fucking described hell. his client as a marvelous, marvelously decent human being who had flown more than 5 million miles without any other incidents. Without ever shitting on a cart, Paul. <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, I think... I think you could. Everybody else collectively has flown all the miles ever. With he's the only guy who ever shit on a cart. That's I've flown five million miles and never shit on a cart. Guys, you know it's a bad day. Guy had a bad day. That's gonna define him. You forever. know what? I, if I had to go out on a limb, I'd say he was drinking gin. Gin is just a mean liquor. Uh, gin, gin put me and uh, got me arrested. Gin, yeah. there's something about gin, dude. Gin, gin uh, what is it about gin gin and tequila it's just the, go you go oh. it's the de it's the devil's cologne man gin no tequila no man there's a lot i've seen a lot of gentlemen tequila drinkers gin just something about gin dude that is like i don't know what everybody goes mississippi burning when they fucking drink gin <laughs> Gin changes the faith too, right? Like you ever, you see somebody's face drunk, Bill, you've seen my face drunk. I've seen your face, gin face drunk. When somebody's drunk on gin, there's like a, it's like a twisted evil. Fucking something happens, dude. It's like an exorcism. You become Mr. Hyde. <laughs> you fucking, your beard gets fuller. You just fucking, you, you're lurking in the shadows. Jack the Ripper juice. That stuff is fucking, I don't know what it is. I remember at last time I had gin, I was with you in uh, New Orleans when we were at the Governor's Palace or whatever that place is called, that great restaurant. Commander Palace. Commander Palace, yeah. We fucking, uh, I had, you, I, you know what I'm having? I think I just had straight gin and I was nervous, that floral taste to it. I'm like, there's something going on here. Hey, dude, I, I got, we got to wrap this podcast up, man. Yeah. I got to hit the gym here. Um, I have right, to live guys. my best life, Paul, and hit the gym. All right, guys. Well, this has been episode 41. Um, speaking of Thanksgiving and the holidays, Thanksgiving weekend, my last dates of the year will be uh, November 26th and 27th, uh, the day after Thanksgiving um, at, what is it? Uh, the Stress Factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Beautiful Bridgeport, Connecticut. So get tickets to that. I will be uh, doing my new hour, and that's the last of the year. So uh, come out to that. Thank everybody at Skankfest who came up and said nice words about myself, about the Verzi effect, about anything better, dude. I got to tell you, that was fucking amazing. Uh, I heard nothing but amazing things about Skankfest. Everybody's dude, saying that they did it right. Dude, I've never seen a festival by comedians, for comedians. Bob Saget showed up and Jessica Kearson. I ended up fucking smoking a cigar in Doug Stanhope's shower with him. It's a fucking whole... 
you know, wild thing. So anyway, yeah, we went to his room and he was just like, yeah, it was, yeah, this giant thing. And someone goes, take a picture. I'm sitting there with a fucking, dr- I mean, dude, that guy's in a suit. We had the greatest time. Uh, <laughs> but everybody coming up, dude, the love in that place, the love and appreciation. I've never felt anything like it, man. I've never felt anything fucking like it before. All the comedians were like, dude, I've been to festivals. This is the first one where everyone there, thousands of knew everyone. Like it was like they knew all the com. It was fucking amazing. I, I, I actually like, dude, I'm not even going to lie. It was one of the only times in comedy where I was just doing something and I almost got like, not like emotional cry, but like you get this feeling of like, holy fuck, this is why I got into comedy. Like the level of appreciation of the fans, the crowds were fucking nuts. I did this outside tent on Friday at noon and everyone's going, how's this going to go? And all these comedians are on it. And there's literally chairs in a parking lot in a big tent. And I went on and, you know, the Skankfest fans are hilarious. They're not dressed well, you know? And I even joked with them. Like, we're outside in a parking lot doing stand-up. And I was like, look, half of you guys look like we should, we should be giving out Thanksgiving turkeys to you, right? Like, they were fucking right. And, and, it, and it fucking crushed. And, like, they just, everything you did, we're just into it, dude. We're, like, crushing this outside thing. Then you go to another venue that's in that same venue. People, oh, dude, I love you. Oh, man, where can I, dude, it was just amazing. So, um, yeah, it was, it was people were, I, I ran into Eddie Pepitone. And he just goes, dude, how this is like one of the most insane dude. Like if you walked in, they were just like, they, they were like, thank you so much. Like dude, how what? underrated is Eddie Pepitone? One of, one of the, <laughs> my favorite Eddie Pepitone joke is when he goes, yeah, the magician came, you see the corner, you see the corner. Now you see the corner, you see the corner. He goes, yeah, go fuck yourself. He goes, that's not a magic trick. He goes, you want to do a trick? <laughs> because tell me how I can feel safe in this world. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, dude. How great is that guy, dude? Uh, no, but, he's unbelievable. Um, I mean, I think he's top five out there for the longest fucking time. And I, I don't, for some fucking reason, ageism or whatever. He just, I think you got to go see Eddie Pepito. No, oh, so, so All good. Right. But uh, yeah, so and I got to go hit an elliptical, Paul. We will. We got to wrap this up. Shout out to Detroit, Michigan, making a comeback, man. Congratulations. You're getting the soulless glass towers too, where you're going to walk in and they're going to play vibe music so they can create a vibe for all the vibeless people that are going to move in there. I wish everybody, I like real Detroit people. I hope hope everybody has a good Christmas season. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just skipping over no you got to celebrate all of the holidays man go um, apple picking do the whole thing with the kids speaking of that i'm gonna go spend my birthday with the kids love you guys i will see you 